Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to start off by saying Yama Yamandai, which is uh, hello and welcome in my language. Uh, my name is Tiana Ferner, and I am a Gomorrah woman from northern New South Wales. Um, I grew up in a small town near Tamworth, and I now work here at BVN as a graduate. Um, I guess I've been asked to do an acknowledgement in the country, so um, I'd like to acknowledge the Gomorrah, the Gomorrah people of the Aurora Nation, um, and I would like to acknowledge the um, elders past and present, and I'd like to extend um, a welcome to any Indigenous people who are here today, so thank you. So, um, hello everyone and welcome to the Sydney Spring Salon and thank you, Tiana. Um, my name's Justine Clark and I'm from Parlour. Um, many of you know that, not all of you. Um, we're really pleased to be back here in Sydney and here at BVN uh, for the uh, 2019 Spring Salon. BVN have been really great supporters of Parlour um, for a very long time and they were a partner on the research project that preceded Parlour that got us all going. They've been very generous hosts tonight, and I'd particularly like to thank Edwina for all her work in making tonight happen. Many of you who've been to salons before will have heard me say that the whole program is possible because of the support of our partner AWS. And you've probably heard me wax lyrical about what a delight they are to work with, and it's all true. So since I was here for the last salon at the beginning of August, We've had five other salons and locations around the country, including our first regional salon in Orange. And that um, the, the, the move to go to Orange and to go to regional New South Wales was very much driven by AWS, and it was a really, um, really fabulous event. So um, not only do they support, support us, but they kind of encourage us to uh, go to places we might otherwise not have think of. So it's, it's a really great collaboration. <laughs> I've done seven salons in eight weeks. <laughs> I'm quite tired. <laughs> anyway, we're coming to Canberra. We are going to Canberra. It's just we went to Orange first. Anyway, shut up. <laughs> At the back. Anyway, so as you also know, the salons provide a friendly environment, as you've just witnessed. <laughs> For people to get together, um, there's only one rule, and that is please try and talk to at least one person you don't already know. Now, in Orange, I thought that that would be impossible, but it seems that 22 architects in and around Orange don't know each other. So I'm sure there are people here in Sydney who also you might not yet know. So the format's really simple. Um, we just invite two women to interview each other. I say it's simple, but I did one myself in Adelaide the other day, and it's actually quite terrifying um, when you're on the stage. So it's an act of great generosity if you, to those uh, people who do agree to be in the chair. Tonight, we've got two um, super effective and experienced women who've agreed to do this, Leonie Lorimer and Ninochka Tchotchoski. We're breaking one of our own rules by having a speaker from our host. We always say, you know, if, you, if, if you're hosting it, you can't have a speaker. Um, but then I just thought it would be really great to have Nanochka and Leonie in conversation. So, you know, the thing is about rules is you can break them. So um, I thought it would be really fantastic to have two women with this really, really senior leadership experience at the, at the kind of CEO level in our profession, which is um, exciting. So Ninochka is the co-CEO here at BVN. She leads the practices research into robotics and is a co-founder of the research sharing platform Robots in Architecture and Construction Australia. Leonie is a strategic consultant with her own Lorimer Consulting, and I believe she's really enjoying paddling her own canoe, as it were. Um, prior to this, she was the CEO of DWP Suitors. She worked client-side in Abu Dhabi, and she was a director of Woods Bagot. Both Leonie and Ninochka are long-term supporters of Parla, and I'm really happy to hand over them to them to kick off the spring seasonal salon. Take it away. How's that? Good. 
Sorry. They didn't even meet. <laughs> yeah, we hadn't met till tonight. Um, but I think that Ninochka is going to kick off with a little bit of her background story. Well, we haven't met till tonight, but we did have a little pre-chat. Sorry, I have a little bit of a malfunction here. Hang on a sec. Um, and what Leonie and I kind of worked out was that we definitely had four things in common in our background. Family of primarily girls, um, at least certainly a matriarchal family. Uh, good education, both barmaids, and uh, which shouldn't go unnoted, I think, and, um, and both spent some good time in London. Um, but um, we'll come to that later. But my, my personal background was um, I did grow up with a strong family of women, one, one brother, but uh, he seemed to get off pretty lightly in the scheme of things. And um, I went to an all-girls school, so I think um, I was never really attuned to the fact that women couldn't just do everything, and that was always instilled into me at an early age. Um, equally, my mother very clearly instilled into me that a good education was the key to success, and whilst men are great, no need to rely on them. So that was <laughs> that was her mantra, um, and so I went to uh, Ravenswood in on the North Shore, and then after school I went actually straight to Sydney University and studied architecture at Sydney Uni for six years, um, where uh, which was a really actually a really influential time for me, and um, I have some lifelong friends that I've made there, two of which are here, Brooke and Antonia, and um, also met some really great people who became kind of foundational probably for my trajectory, which was Lawrence Neild, uh, who was our um, professor of final year architecture, and Richard Francis Jones, who was one of our tutors, um, who's now um, FJMT. And, um, and then in my final year, I also was fortunate enough to have Alex Popoff, uh, Alex Popoff critique my final project, and then he offered me a job. So I, um, <laughs> I was sort of very lucky from university, um, but equally I worked pretty hard, and I remember those being pretty hard years. Um, but I started in small practice with Alex doing high-end residential, and then moved to after that when I decided that I really wanted to explore different scales of practice. Um, I moved to, uh, I went and had a chat with Richard and went and joined MGT, which is now FJMT. Um, and after I was there for a couple of years, I had a coffee with Lawrence and then <laughs> came and um, joined Lawrence. <laughs> so, um, and then Lawrence was also a co-editor of an architecture journal, which Richard and Lawrence and I co-edited um, straight after university. Um, and so Lawrence was my professor, my co-editor, um, my boss, and then my partner, uh, as in business partner once I became a principal, and then uh, now he's a friend, and it's quite a lovely trajectory. Yeah. You've omitted a couple of times when you <laughs> <Two> stopped. <times. laughs> so I did stop a couple of times. So after I did joined BBN and I was here in Sydney for a little while, um, I decided to... We, my boyfriend at the time and I were coming back from a trip up near the central coast, driving down that Gosford freeway, and we're, we're both like, you know what, we could really do with a break. So we both walked in the next day and resigned from our jobs, me from here and him from... <clears throat> he was at um, working on the Renzo Piano building at the time, and we took off for a couple of years and um, travelled around Australia for about six months, and uh, I rode my horses, lived on my sister's farm, um, went and worked in London and then came back and did some more sort of dressage riding. Um, and then when, when I was on the way back, uh, BBN asked, had meanwhile started the Melbourne studio and asked if I would um, join them in Melbourne. And so um, that's what I did. I thought it was nice to come back into the fold that I knew, but not exactly in the same way that I was before. And at what point were you pulling the beers? I was pulling beers in fourth year at uni when everyone was supposed to be doing architectural things, but I just ended up working in bars and going to the Ministry of Sound most of the time. And then 
Uh, it was a recession though, and I did my thesis on bars and restaurant in London. I mean, yay. <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was a cutting edge piece of work, needless to say. <laughs> but it was good time. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, Leonie, interestingly, though, uh, you have also worked as a barmaid and also spent some time in London and also uh, come from a family of girls with um, strong educational uh, slant to, to your growing up. Do you want to just talk a bit about those parallels? So, in fact, um, the educational thing in my family started with um, my mother's generation because uh, with seven children born in the 10s and 1920s, um, six of the seven of those ended up with a uh, doctor in front of their name. Um, so uh, then when it got to our generation with four girls, uh, by that point, and I must say that my mother's generation, there were four uh, women, who uh, three of which had the, the um, doctorate qualification. So um, it's a pretty strong theme. Impressive. So when it came to our generation, like uh, Ninochka, um, there was never any question that you couldn't do something um, because we didn't we didn't even have the one token boy for people to say, well, you know, a boy should do this and a girl should do that. You know, my father needed to get us to do all those blokey things. So I remember times when he'd sit me down and um, we'd stew over an engine manual together or something like that. You know. Anyway, uh, I should start my career story, shouldn't I, rather than <laughs> waffling on. Um, well, I, please, go on. I mean, I think it's pretty amazing that in 1988 you were a director of Woods Bagot. Mm. It's a good place to start. That's true. <laughs> so um, I suppose um, I studied my architecture at Sydney University and um, then um, my husband wanted to study in the UK. Well, he wasn't my husband then, but my mother said, well, if you're going to support him, you better marry him. So that was 41 years ago. Um, so we went over to the UK, finished my architecture, um, uh, sandwiched an, uh, the second degree between having two children. So I got back here at the age of 28 with two um, small children in tow. And uh, within about I think it was about 18 months I was asked to set up the interior design business of the um, uh, company Stevenson and Turner, which was an old traditional firm. So I um, became a CEO first at the age of 28. So by the time I um, was setting up Woods Baggett in Sydney, it was just, in fact, Bob, you to remember, um, because riders gave us free space. Um, so uh, there was me and uh, Tregoning and a secretary, and we, we actually opened the doors of Woods Bagot in 1988. So, um, And what's extraordinary about that, though, is you were 20 years at Woods Bagot as the only woman on the board? That's correct, yes. Which is pretty amazing, isn't it? And, yes, yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that, what that was like? Was it... Well, I think when when we have movements today, um, you know, uh, uh, things that are driving, uh, publicly driving cultural change and placing value on culture, back in those days, um, it's 30 years ago, uh, we didn't really have those sorts of things. So uh, I just had to just forge ahead and, and just push on through um, no matter what I came across so and there wasn't really a great reference for what was good behavior what was bad behavior you know um, what was good corporate governance what was you know a good business strategy we didn't really have any of those things so in fact um, my uh, MBA was reading um, the Harvard Business Review which is another thing that Ninochka does so we both read the Harvard Business Review avidly top tip there right right there people get on get on get on that subscription so really it was you know over that 20 years there was a lot of change because we went from um, uh, having a vision to be a national practice then a vision to be an international practice then a global practice and at every iteration of that, I seem to be the one that put in place all the processes to do that because, you know, um, my 12 male partners or 11 male partners, they were all for just, you know, let's, you know, rip out there and hang up the shingle and get on with it. And I'd be in the background going, but 
hang on, we need to do this and that and the other and putting it all in, in train so that we seamlessly did it. <laughs> Like a swan. Um, and actually, Leonie, you have the most extraordinary CV, really. It's um, very impressive. And it seems like your desire to implement change has been a fairly consistent, almost driver of you um, taking roles or staying within roles. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think another thing that Ninochka and I have in common is we have come up through um, being exposed to a lot of workplace. And in workplace, you are working with um, CEOs of major companies. So uh, we get another free MBA by working with those CEOs and looking at what they're doing and then bringing that back into our businesses. So when you've got a strategy and you're saying, you know, where do we need to get to, you've got to do stuff to get there. So that means change. So you've got to lead change. Uh, everything in the world around changes. So you, if you are not changing, then you're going backwards. So um, I think that knowing what those other businesses that were our clients were doing gave us a lot of confidence in terms of what you do in your own organisation. Mm. But Nenichka's CV is equally, you know, dense over pages of all the projects that you've done, and you've worked across such a diverse mm. range of building typologies. Can you talk about whether you've felt ever being put in a box? Only at uni and final year, where I remember, I don't know if you guys remember this, but I do remember a very specific conversation where I was like, I don't want to be put in a box anymore. I won't only do Corbusier and Kahn. Um, I'm going to break free. And uh, and, there, and a big conversation sort of got debated at university, and especially given Sydney University's kind of lineage of thinking that was, you know, very much kind of embedded into most of our uh, our tutors and so on. So, no, that was about the only time I think I felt really put in a box. But um, uh, I I guess whether it's through, um, you know, maybe it's a parallel to one time when I was ridiculously stupid enough to decide that we would, in Melbourne, we had a charity, we were doing a charity um, ab sale down the Sofitel, which is like 60-storey high-rise tower and I was like yeah awesome let's do that that sounds great so we all dressed up in outfits in super people super hero outfits and I was like I'll go Wonder Woman arrive with my red boots and the whole thing never done an abseil before except for the weekend before they took us down a you know a six meter drop down somewhere at the Grampians <laughs> and I was like oh yeah I've so got this this is just a snap and then Next thing I know, I'm like, should I wear the boots or should I put some sand shoes on? And they're like, no, wear the boots, they look great. So we're standing on the edge of the precipice and or the edge of the parapet, I should say, 60 floors up, never done a proper abseil before. And I'm like, just immediately at that point was the first time I realised this is completely terrifying. Um, anyway, I finished the abseil, but it was just horrific and I actually... Uh, it's knocked that sort of stuff out of me forever. But um, my point was that I think I'm a little bit like the person before the parapet. You know, you you sort of you can go into these things without completely knowing what exactly you're facing, and that's probably a good thing sometimes. <laughs> so it's a bit of a balance between um, having that sort of fearless courage and also having some vision on what might happen. Um, but. But it is interesting about the workplace component because um, I have done quite a few workplace projects and I do think if you're curious about looking at other businesses and other business models, you can really pick up a lot outside of architecture. And um, I've always really uh, been inspired by lots of things outside of the profession as well as inside the profession. And um, for me, that's fairly important to stay across a, a kind of a big picture, holistic, much more global view. But um, Leonie, I have a question for you about vision, which is... Before um, you do... Yes, sorry. Can I just pick up on yeah, your yeah. Wonder Woman things? Um, was it Wonder Woman or something? Wonder Woman, Woman yeah. yeah. Uh, because <laughs> I, I think it... it um, 
It talks to that chestnut called confidence um, because uh, I think confidence is probably the central issue for women um, and it's actually no um, surprise that the Triple J Hottest 100 song last year was about confidence. And um, I think that you don't get confidence. I mean, well, you can have educations like ours and family backgrounds like ours, and that's fine. But most people don't. And the way you get confidence is actually to take risks and put yourself out there and overcome obstacles. So if you have this sort of positive attitude and you go and expose yourself, once you've done it, then you feel more confident. Um, so I would encourage you to actually um, <clears throat> take risks as, a, you know, stop seeing um, all the reasons you can't do something. Just have a go, go off that 60 storey tower, but not literally, let's be metaphorical. <laughs> and um, and you will find as you <laughs> conquer each little thing, you will feel more confident. So yeah, back to your question. I totally, totally agree with that. Um, so back to vision. Um, I'm really keen to know, um, as you, you as a seasoned now ex-CEO um, to a first-year CEO, co-CEO, um, what can you see in the rearview mirror that maybe you couldn't see before and um, what, what advice would you have to me? Well, I think there are... Um, sort of basic process things that you do as a CEO and when you've done it a few times it sort of becomes second nature. But I think when you come into a role new and it doesn't matter if it's a CEO role or it's an appointment to an associate or whatever it is, they've put you there for a reason and um, the purpose is not to leave things as they are. The purpose is that you make some change, that that um, you do something um, towards a better outcome. So if you're going in and you're just looking around, you're just going to do exactly what everybody else is, you're not really doing the job. So um, when you go into a role, particularly as a CEO, it comes with a huge amount of responsibility. So, um, you know, the, the process thing that you do is what have we got today, where we want to get to and how we're going to get there. So um, that's in its most simple mm. terms. And I think you've just been on a strategy session, which is, yeah. and if you're parachuted in, you don't necessarily know what you've got today, but you presumably know what you've got today after how many, 19 <laughs> years or something. Um, and so each time you're looking forward and you're saying, well, where do we want to get to? But then... What you need to do is get those, once that's in place, get those steps. And I think uh, I like to start with language um, to, to name those things. So if you want to, um, you know, uh, go to a certain place or become mm. something, if you can give it a name mm. that you can then, people will understand what that name mm. is. Mm. And then you, you've got to have al allocated responsibility and you've got to hold people account for that. So each of the bits of the strategy, if you can put that onto somebody and then they have to report up for how that's going. So you're sharing that load, mm. but then you, you're constantly communicating. You also then need to continuously communicate every single little thing that you do. You're building the culture, but you're saying, I'm doing this because of that strategy. This mm. is part of that. So you're doing incremental change through that day-to-day -day communication. But at the end of the day, it is a courageous thing. Um, nobody's done it before because the world was different yesterday from today and tomorrow. So even if you did it yesterday, you're going to have to do it differently tomorrow. Mm. So it's a courageous thing. But the metaphor I would use is what you're trying to do is release the butterfly from the chrysalis. So you're trying to um, allow the future organisation to uh, come out of that chrysalis to evolve and, and to, to fly. But I would say in the process, the chrysalis has to be discarded. So as you change culture, you say, 
these are i've named these things that i want you to do but these are the things i want you to stop doing and these are the um the processes you're going to leave behind these are the behaviors you're going to leave behind um and maybe section of the business you might leave behind. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, that's that's my no, metaphor. No, that's really interesting actually, because often you talk about where you want to go to, but you're not necessarily talking about what you need to let go of to get there. So um, articulating that is good advice. I think that's really interesting. But you've been leading another very difficult thing, which is innovation. Um, would you? Take a few minutes to to, to share. Sure, uh, is sure. that so long as it's? Oh no, you've put it in an article, so it can't be confidential. <laughs> no, no, it's not confidential. I read I mean, it in I the guess, public I guess domain. It's, I, rather than sort of seeing it as leading it, I guess I feel it's uh, it's something that I feel passionate about, and um, really what I feel passionate about is being optimistic about the future, and um, I don't feel comfortable with just letting the future play out however it might. Um, I feel like we all have a role to play that's really important, especially right at the moment, in starting to shape up a future that is an optimistic one for all of us and for our kids and our families. Um, and actually, as architects, we have we play a reasonably significant role in that. Um, what troubles me is how blinkered we are sometimes as a profession to that and that we... Um, you know, we like the nostalgia of architecture um, and design and we don't see where the future is going and we don't see how important it is for us to start to engage in the conversation in a slightly different way um, and to think about how we're going to kind of create a future that's going to be not dystopian when we think about the fourth industrial Rev revolution but something that's really optimistic. Um, and so that's really, I guess that's my fundamental driver. So in that, um, you know, well, the future I see is one where robotics play an important part of what we do, where, you know, we're able to build much, we're, de we're able to design better, smarter, build better, um, build smarter, use less of the planet's resources, create great places to live, that we don't lose sight of social cohesion and place as an important thing where, it create, creates belonging for everyone. So I think what I'm really interested in is how we combine sort of technology, new processes um, with the sort of aspects of social cohesion and um, societal change um, and uh, do that in a way that actually allows us to uh, work with the forces that I feel are kind of around us at the moment, even from a geopolitical perspective where we're seeing the world changing. But, you know, we need to hold on to that. We need to be part of this because every day we're making decisions that actually impact. And every day we're building something that lasts 25 years or 50 years or 100 years. And, you know, we want to know that what we're doing is actually the right thing. And um, we shouldn't be doing it from 50 years, a lens from 50 years ago. We should be doing it with a lens that's 20, 20 years ahead of ourselves. Um, so that's what I, that's why I'm passionate about those things. I think it's really important. But then you've got an innovation agenda within your firm and um, we're working in a paradigm which is fee-for-service mm. and then we need to invest in all of these uh, things that will transform our business. So mm. how, how are you mm. dealing with that or what are, you, what are your ideas about what could happen? Well, I think there's, there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, we will... Um, that the world will change in our lifetime as architects, that, you know, the way that um, we operated 20 years ago will be different in 10 years' time. Um, and I think that comes through all aspects of what we do. It comes to how we charge for our service, what is our value, what is the contribution we make, how do we make people see our value, will we still have value? Um, and then how do we actually bring ourselves closer to fabrication and construction methodologies. Um, I could see a pathway forward where we don't charge fees. We just um, we charge for the value that we create in terms of a living architecture model. 
um, that we're not a fee-for-service business anymore. I just I think we will probably find that we will come under pressure under all aspects of what we do in the future. It won't just be um, about the way we design things. So I think we have to start thinking about all of these things. I think we'll continue to, we'll probably partner and collaborate more with others as we already are, uh, both internationally, locally, um, different groups coming together with different mindsets in a way not that different from thinking about how you want diversity on a board, you want diversity in terms of how you manifest projects and um, how you make sure that they actually have the richness that we want within cultures and society. And so you need the richness of the thinking and the thought processes in that as well. I think also the construction industry is pretty much the last industry to um, get into the modern world. Um, when you, you know, you've still got blokes going up in lifts, you know, to go and do a bit of tiling on a wall and things like this, which is just... Well, you've still got the guy in the lift that's just doing... It's the lift pushing the button. I mean... So like that. that's like a hundred thousand um, dollars of someone sitting in a stuffy lift all day. And we're going to see, I think, that industry die if it doesn't vertically integrate with us. So we have to we have to become vertically mm. integrated and control all of that information that re resides in those virtual building models. Mm. And um, and we need to put ourselves in the centre of that. We need to control that information uh, through the life that, cycle. Yeah, and, and but see mm. that as a positive thing for us. Actually, it brings us kind of closer to the potential of moving away from um, very much a commercialised model of architecture into something that goes back to a crafted world when we start to think about 3D printing and robotics and prefabrication. We can actually, it affords us different levels of design freedom that we haven't been able to commercially um, achieve just because of cost issues. So, which brings me to the point about craft. So, and this is a, a, a question I'm really interested in, um, Leone, which is I had a, um, we, we did a project for the Australian National University recently and I had a conversation with Brian Schmidt, who's the vice chancellor, and he is a Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist and then he became the vice chancellor of ANU. And um, when I took on this role, we had a bit of a chat and he said, well, let me just give you a bit of advice from me. And he said, his advice was, um, it's really important that you stay in touch with your craft. Uh, you, you know, he really struggles being a scientist and trying to kind of do the vice chancellor role, but he still engages in research because for him, it's kind of what fuels his thinking around, you know, what's the next step for the university and so on. So my question for you is, did you manage to stay in touch with your craft in all those years of being CEO and managing director and... I've got a couple of um, lovely ladies over here looking at me, waiting for my answer to that. I should ask them, but um, staying in touch with the craft, um, I've always... Um, uh, aim to stay on projects right through the, to the end of the concept phase because I think the briefing and the concept is where you set the project up for success and so uh, we would I'd also, also be participating in as many design reviews as possible and you know sort of going that's not good enough <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> let's chuck that out let's do something or all that waffle don't you mean this or whatever um but i think let's define what what the craft is because um again some of the debates that go on these days are you know uh, uh, should schools be teaching more parametric modeling or should they be you know more aligned with you know construction or whatever but to me, um, if you want to define our craft by what can they sue you for, <laughs> then um, pretty much, uh, and I say, um, you know, pretty much the architect has to do everything. So um, at the end of the day, we're going to be held accountable for whether somebody goes wow when they walk in and also um, for whether somebody slips on the floor or trips over something or whether the roof leaks or I believe 
somebody was telling me the other day about the, um, uh, I think it was the MIT building or something that Frank Gehry did and he settled out of court for $50 million because he didn't understand thoroughly enough the climate specific to that location and didn't allow enough tolerance for hot to cold in the design construction. So our craft is everything. Now I'm seeing a bit of your um, Director of Planning and Development in Dubai coming through there, Leonie. So for those of you that don't know, Leonie's actually had a pretty amazing um, uh, career as uh, uh, as well, post Woods, Baggin and so on, being a senior design manager as well in, in Dubai, uh, Abu Dhabi, sorry. Um, managing some pretty significant museums, including the Louvre by Nouvelle. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because that must have been a pretty interesting time, going from your time at Woods Bagot into the nitty gritty of projects and uh, trying to get these incredible projects up and making them a success. Well, I think um, the... And, and did you? Was that... Was that a, like, did you feel like, I mean, in some ways you were going, getting back on the tools. How did that feel? Well, I don't think I've ever left the tools, so I don't think I was feeling anything there, but I did get out of the box. So where I had been held in the workplace box, the interiors box, if you like, the Middle East allowed me to get back to the big scale. So I um, went straight with Woods Baggett in Doha to a 25 building campus and also a science and technology park, which um, both projects were in the sort of billions. And um, then I was um, working on, I, I jumped across to a client and was working on um, international portfolios of multiple projects all, you know, at huge scale and then after the global financial crisis, then on to three museums at once, so uh, and a whole island. Um, so, <laughs> you know, but again, okay. it's like anything. What architects do is is you break it down. Um, you go back to the fundamentals of, um, you know, who are we building this for? How is it going to operate? Um, uh, how's you know how's it going to function? Is it going to look great? Um, you know, is the air conditioning going to work? So we, you, you apply the same sort of processes that you do at that scale um, that you learnt at the small scale. It's the same kind mm. of thinking, but there were some terrifying things. Like I'm, we're going to go and see the finished Louvre in about um, what three weeks time. Um, because I want to see it before the rust sets into that 180 <laughs> metre dome. And I spent some time trying to work out how we would clean the bloody thing, you know, because it's going to aggressively corrode. But <laughs> I didn't say that here. That must have been somebody else. The light's beautiful, though. The light is spectacular. <laughs> um, I was going to switch it up a bit. So um, a common question that I get or others get, I think, are uh, like, you know, have you had any mentors or key mentors? Um, I wanted to talk instead about advocates. And um, in my experience, I think that um, an important part of progressing your career is about having people advocating for you at the right moment, um, particularly around a boardroom table or a partner's table or whatever. Um, and I wanted to know if you had anyone that you felt really advocated for you that made that difference for you. I didn't. I haven't had the same luck that you've had in having wonderful mentors. Um, uh, I've probably been more in the right place at the right time, and if the doors open to crack, I've kicked it Ram open. Right in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> at, may well be a, a timing thing, a generational mm. thing. Um, there were um, some uh, key people that I think taught me or, you know, fantastic things and opened doors. One of them was, um, I'm looking at Bob here, because mm -hmm. Managing Director of Ryder Hunt, um, his method of marketing was to have a thing called the Society for Obscure Events. You'll remember that. <laughs> and Bob, you'll remember that I was the only woman that was allowed into that all-male networking forum. 
right? And what that did for me is it got me in the room. That's another one of the things I advocate. If you're trying to sponsor people or trying to get gender equity or trying to get any form of diversity, make sure those people are in the room. So I don't care whether they, by rank or expertise, um, are entitled to be in the room. If you haven't got equal numbers of people from that diverse pool that you want, just get them in the room because they'll never learn to get in the room if they're not in the room. So Mike did that for me. Another um, amazing person was a lady called Chuck Batista who we brought out in 1987 actually um, from HOK in the United States. And uh, Chuck was a proponent of a thing that we had never heard of here, which was strategic facility planning. We would now call that workplace transformation. But I you know, went on the road with Chuck um, learning how to take uh, a business strategic plan and translate that into a workplace that would um, re uh, enable them to deliver that business outcome. And that was 30 years ago. Uh, we became the leaders in that and which is why we became leaders in workplace. Um, and apart from that, I suppose it's external people that have inspired me. Um, just, you know, again, coming to things like this, uh, we held a, um, a couple of functions in our office back in the late 80s. We had uh, Eva Yerikna, who is an extraordinary British architect and structural engineer, who I wouldn't be surprised if she's not the next Pritzker Prize winner. And um, just listening to her, and I had the pleasure of... Uh, meeting uh, Viviana uh, is it too long from George Jensen, who's a jewellery designer. Mm. So again, our you know craft mm. outside mm. our industry. So I've always said, go to as many things as you can because you always learn something and you always meet someone. Mm. Justine, how are we going for time? Um, sorry, I'm just sorry. <laughs> Hey, she's just text messaging. Don't worry about it. Are you doing your emails? Are you like enjoying this? Or... <laughs> so I wanted to throw a little show of hands to the crowd. Who here thinks they have someone who's advocated for them? And do you think does any everyone who thinks that's made a difference for their career? Yeah. And um, what is your advice to the people that didn't? have their hand up? Um, I actually think in the end it's actually about building relationships. Like it's it's doing two things, two things in parallel. One is um, do the things that are in front of you really well and don't always look what's ahead of you because I think as I observe a lot of people that um, they're so focused on the road ahead that they've actually lost sight of what they're doing today and what you're getting kind of judged on in a way is what you're doing today and if what you're doing today is not great, nobody's going to give you the tomorrow. So that would be my first thing. And then the second thing is I think um, it's really important to actually build relationships with people in a genuine way who you feel you can connect with and you find a connection um, with at a personal level but also at a professional level and that you have a sort of a synergy about your thinking and your thought processes and the things that you care about. I think it's really important. And and in my view, in at the end of the day, when the decisions need to be made, um, if there's a strong voice around the table that is a supportive of you, then it makes, you know, that is really the differentiator, actually. Mm. So shall we do final yeah. closing, you know? <laughs> or should we accept that that's your, the final closing? Because I, I would just finish by saying that um, just whatever you're doing, do it to the best um, and don't worry about whether it's making sense and it's or trying to force your career into a lineal way because as Edward de Bono says, when you get to the end and look backwards on your career, um, it all looks logical in hindsight. It's <laughs> a good place to end. <laughs> Thank you.
was actually trying to work out which bit to put on okay. my social media. Anyway. <laughs> Um, we'll take a couple of questions if people have questions, and um, but we do want to leave time for more mingling, chatting, um, more of um, Naomi's fantastic food, wine, um, bailing up these two great women. But if you would um, like to ask a question publicly that you think um, the answers might be of benefit to everybody, please put your hand up. Hello. Um, those breaks that you were talking about in your career, do you think if you were going without any stops, will, be, will you be at the same place? Or do you no. think those sort of breaks are important sometimes to take? I think the break for me, which was about two years out of my career, I actually think it accelerated my trajectory. So, you know, does everyone be also across the idea of the mini retirement? I'm a bit of a fan of that one. <laughs> Is that what I'm doing at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. Time? You can sort of drop in, drop out. You know, it doesn't have to be forever. You can have a couple of years off. No, I think that the couple of years off I had, I think, were really important. Um, I also think, you know, when you when you stay in one practice for a long time, you know, people do see you in a certain way. It probably gave me the ability to just step away from that and then to see me slightly differently. So, but. I'll, also, I just think, you know, we're going to be working for a long time. So it's actually really important for all of us to um, fuel our own intellectual tank. Um, and that is in whatever way that takes. And, and um, I think you can't, you can't just sort of run continuously without, without some of those stops. So I think it's a really good thing to do whenever that time suits you. Okay, anyone else? I've been told you have to speak in the microphone. I have to be in the microphone. Thank you both. This has been a fantastic night. I wanted to ask a question from the pages of the HBR and to say, in the CEO role, have you dabbled with the idea of 360-degree feedback and how do you get input into how you're doing not just from the advocates and the mentors that put you in the role and who give you the mandate to take on the role, but from the people that you're leading and you're managing? Um, I'm very, very strong on 360 feedback. And um, so uh, instituted it at Woods Bagot and then um, I put it into place at um, DWP as well and um, from literally day one. and. Um, I think my lovely Deb in the HR started off with something like 26 questions. By the end, we had it nailed down to eight questions online, click, 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 click. So we had a longitudinal of about 30 of the senior staff um, over the six years that I was there. So I was able to, um, on those eight different aspects of um, uh, what you do in a leadership role, including myself, so I'm getting benchmarked against them as well. Um, and so we were able to actually numerically track improvement in them individually and in the culture of the whole organisation. And um, I also supplemented that with um, three of us going off and doing the human synergistics um, LSI and GSI training. And so we started to back up that um, uh, simple 360 with the um, professional 360 and so it became accredited to debrief people in those behavioural profiles as well. Yeah, and let's just say um, we're well aware of our weaknesses here at BBN. <laughs> um, no, we do, um, in fact, when we were working out, you know, who should be the next CEO for BBN. James had been in the role for about 13 years, so James Gross, a long time. And um, they're quite difficult conversations to have as a group of equal partners. Um, and so we all did the LSI and so we all did like... So can, can you, for those who don't know, what's LSI? You go, Leone, come on. It's, yeah. Oh, because I'm accredited. <laughs> yeah. It's the best thing for architects because it's the lifestyles, um, what is L something I can't inventory? Lifestyles inventory. 
and um, it's a circle and it's blue at the top which is constructive, red which is um, uh, aggressive, defensive and, or, uh, and green which is passive, defensive, whatever. And there's 12 things on the dial and architects can understand red is aggressive, green is passive and blue is constructive. <laughs> and so the rest of the corporate world things really what awesome. you do is you then get <laughs> from all the questionnaires the 360s you get mapped on your own perception of yourself and the perception that other people have as a group of you mm. and if you're like flared right out to the edges you're really really bad if you sort of it, there's a, a line which is the average of um, what 14,000 people around the world are if you're sort of on the money and so you want to be more up in the blue and um, it's sort of around that average line but what it's doing is telling you how your behavior is impacting on other people in colors that architects can understand <laughs> except for the colorblind ones um, but it is an interesting point i think it's good to um I'm only, I don't know, eight months into this role at the moment, so perhaps at the end of the first year that will be something that Neil and I will look to do. I think it would be a good thing to do. We do check in with our fellow principals reasonably regularly, but not so much everyone else, so I think that's something we should look to. Okay, one more. Maybe a slightly left of field question, but I was curious around salaries and... Um, <laughs> I know that there's a few organizations in the States, I think, and in Europe who have complete tra transparency in their business. And your opinion on that? Do we have transparency? No, what you would think about it. Or, transparency, yeah, it? yeah. To make those public. Well, I suppose the, um, the first thing to say is that as principals, we're all remunerated equally at BBN. So even though Neil and I are co-CEOs, we're in effect the same as everybody else and we have the same voting rights and the same remuneration. We're just charged with different responsibilities. Um, in terms of making that transparent, I don't know. I think that it would be that would be difficult. Um, it would be a challenge. We'd have to have a good hard think about that, I think. For the for everybody else, you mean? Um, well, we what we do do is we actually do do that every year in all the salary reviews. And I think Brian, you're up there. I think we're pretty much on par, male and females, across every sector. Yeah. So as a, um, a, fe a female partner or a male partner, you're remunerated equally and across every kind of, if you like, level of BBN, we've worked really hard to make sure that's the case. And every single time we do salary reviews, we analyse it on that basis as well. So um, we're not fully transparent with everyone, so we don't disclose everybody's salaries, but we are holding all of ourselves accountable to delivering on what we've said we were going to deliver, which is gender parity. Do you... um, we've always worked with um, pay bands, you know, that are um, available and expressed. Um, but I think looking forward, um, the new um, sorts of HR softwares that are available um, are uh, enabling um, much more frequent um, evaluation of people and probably moving more to evaluation at the end of every project or every assignment so that you're not sort of getting this pent up um, gap or, or not catching people up if they're progressing fast that you can actually know project by project how well people are tracking. So I think the, the future is going to get better in HR management because of the sorts of softwares that are available now. Certainly a big push to you know, increasing transparency for all. Which if anyone wants to publish their salaries, send them to me.
but you know to be transparent as a company not as an individual um, to, to be transparent there's so much complexity mm. around decision making with all of these mm. things that you've got to be very careful about how anything is communicated because you know numbers are one thing but the whole the sort of context of the numbers is another and and again that's where i think softwares are helping to generate um clear data that explains why you're doing things mm. yeah. or drives you to do things yeah. I well, I think it's very tricky and I think it's a good place to end. So um, pl please thank, uh, pay equity for all. Um, please thank our fabulous speakers. <laughs> Big time. Um, clap, clap, <laughs> go on, clap. <laughs>